Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Supreme Court rule against amendments to increase retirement age for holders of the offices of Director of Public Prosecutions and Auditor General. Students stabbed to death amid ongoing violent school conflicts. And later in sports, ISA Under-19 Hockey Championships to be decided today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Shane Masters and here are the details. The Supreme Court has ruled as null and void the amendments to the Constitution, which increased the retirement age for the holders of the offices of Director of Public Prosecutions and Auditor General. Now, the decision was handed down in the Civil Division of the Supreme Court this morning. There was outcry when Parliament amended the Constitution, which allowed for the retirement age for the holders of the offices of Director of Public Prosecutions, DPP, and Auditor General to increase. In its ruling today, the Supreme Court struck down Section 2.2 of the Constitution amendments, which was passed last year by both Houses of Parliament. This Court has ruled that Section 2.1 of the Act is constitutional. Section 2.1 of the Act has amended the Constitution as regards the retirement age of the Director of Public Prosecutions. Section 2.2 of the Act is not a valid section and is severed from the Constitution because the process remains unchanged for extending the retirement age. Section 2.2 is unconstitutional, null, void, and of no legal effect. In bringing the case to the courts, opposition leader Mark Golding had asked the court to rule on the constitutionality of the amendments to sections 96.1 and 121.1 of the Constitution. The opposition argued that the government hurriedly pushed the bill through Parliament and maintained that it was not consulted on the matter. The amendments facilitated the change in retirement age for the DPP and Auditor General from 60 to 65 years. The bill, which was piloted by Justice Minister Delroy Chuck, was introduced Introduced on July 25 last year, then debated and passed in the House of Representatives on the same day. It was approved in the Senate three days later. The amendment meant Paula Lowellen could continue in office for at least another two years. It was a second extension for Miss Lowellen, who received a three-year extension in 2020 when she turned 60. Meanwhile, in reacting to the judgment, the opposition says the outcome was not an attack on Ms. Lewin. Leader of Opposition Business, Philip Paulwell, maintains that if the government of the day had been willing to have open dialogue, then a member of the public service would not be facing what is termed public humiliation. We have always said that this was not about Ms. Lewin, and it's more to do with our fundamental belief and respect for the Constitution. It is also an important statement on governance. A lot of these things can be avoided, you know, if there is respect for the opposition in Parliament. And this matter could have been dealt with by a conversation between the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition, and which, which is what the Constitution requires. And if that were done and respect is given, then we wouldn't have this unfortunate situation now where a public servant is um, being embarrassed. A St. James student has succumbed to injuries he received yesterday following an attack by a group of boys from his school. This incident comes hours after a brawl in the corporate area where three students suffered minor injuries. Kerry Ann Simpson reports. Another brawl, this time in St. James. However, this one was fatal. It's reported that 15-year-old Raniel Plummer, a resident of Point District in the parish, and other students had an altercation at the Irwin High School on Wednesday. But he was attacked and stabbed as he walked along the roadway leading from the school yesterday. He later succumbed to those injuries. It's not clear at this time what led to the altercation. President of the Jamaica Association of Principals and Vice Principals of Secondary Schools, Lindvern Wright, says despite the best efforts of the Ministry of Education and school administrators, some children resort to violence to resolve conflicts. 
Mr. Wright says the situation requires all of society intervention as violence among students is at crisis levels. He was reacting to the outbreak of violent clashes involving students of several corporate area schools. The dispute has reportedly stemmed from a love triangle. A meeting to resolve the issue is to be held at Calabar High School today. Speaking today on the morning agenda on Power 106 FM, Mr. Wright says violence has become the default response of children because they see it as acceptable behavior. All of us as a society have this thing to deal, and I don't think that we have really put the time and resources in dealing with it. Or the problem has just become bigger than all of us. Because I think a school really is the last place that you would want to have this dealt with. And I think what this means now that these school leaders have to be taking this on is that every single one of us, from school leaders to prime minister to governor general to every single person, has got to understand that this is a crisis. That when your children who are supposed to, to, be, to, 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 to really not have got to this stage as yet, are at this stage where all of us as a nation are in, are in fear and in horror because of how they have played out. The examples, I think, as a nation, you know, we have, we, we, we have given them and how the dynamics of our nation have brought them to that kind of violence. Kerry and Simpson, TVJ News. As the real estate conference gets underway in Montego Bay, St. James promises that no development will be approved in the city without amenities for the disabled community. Mayor of Montego Bay, Richard Vernon, made that declaration on Thursday. Kalisha Williams is covering the conference and now reports. Montego Bay is poised for several large-scale developments over the next few years. Among them, what is expected to be the tallest building in the Caribbean, a 28-story facility called the Pinnacle. This strategic investment is driving and unlocking development, as evidenced by the approval of approximately 50 billion Jamaican dollars in commercial and res residential projects in over seven years. As the city continues to grow, in keeping with the Disabilities Act, Mayor of Montego Bay, Richard Vernon, made this assurance. Our council will approve no commercial building without the requisite provisions for persons with disabilities. As for the existing facilities in the city, Mr. Vernon explained that stakeholders have been engaged to ensure they are disability friendly. Now, the International Real Estate Conference is expected to provide the opportunity for others to weigh in. We encourage developers to appreciate building codes and regulations and to be cognizant that modifications, reconstruction and demolition require permits. The curtains will close on the three-day conference on Saturday and I'll have more updates in subsequent newscasts. Reporting from the Montego Bay Convention Center in St. James, I'm Kalisha Williams for TVJ News. An estimated $250 million in fake goods have been seized by the Counterterrorism and Organized Crime Division, CTOC, in St. Anne on Wednesday. Now, the operation represents a huge success for the unit. But as Jamela Maitland reports, CTOC is forced to contend with citizens whose love for brands and the notion of selling fake goods as not being a serious crime as real issues. If you live, work, or shop in and around Ocheria, St. Anne, then it's quite likely that you've heard about Biao's top pink fashion store on Main Street, Beecham Plaza. It sells shoes and clothes to belts, bags, and household items. But according to CTOC, a lot of the goods here are fake. We discovered a large quantity of counterfeit Crocs, Nike, Puma, Gucci, uh, Supreme, and uh, other, other host of um, brands. The estimated value of these goods this morning uh, is about 250 million Jamaican dollars. A Chinese national was also charged. The fines, up to $1 million per trademark or a maximum of 12 months in prison. Head of Intellectual Property Rights Unit at CTOC, Assistant Superintendent Victor Barrett, described it as a huge success. But he argues that Jamaicans' love for brands make it difficult to truly clamp down on it. Whilst you have an appetite for a brand and everybody wants to wear um, a particular brand and get into a particular status or social class by wearing a brand, 
We understand. But buying counterfeiting does not help because you're fueling an illegal activity and you're contributing to, to the informal sector of the economy where the country does not get um, the enough revenue as if they, 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 they channel it into the formal revenue stream. Additionally, he says there are those who believe that selling fake goods is not a real crime. CTOC has been blasted for carrying out its operation by some citizens who accuse the agency of targeting particular stores. Is CTOC then fighting a losing battle? The simple answer is that we're enforcing intellectual property rights. It is nothing personal. Right? Jamaica is just a tiny space in the world market, right? but nonetheless, we have an obligation under the law. And rightly so, Jamaica is not the only country that has a counterfeiting issue, but we can roll over and play dead. ASP Barrett admits that there is need for more public awareness about the negative ripple effects of selling fake goods. The same creativity, the same effort that a merchant will take to bring a goods, a four foot container across the Atlantic Ocean into Jamaica and then you're selling these goods at a reduced price when compared to the authentic. It signals something, right, that these goods are mass produced and they may be produced by using forced labor. Somewhere, somewhere in the world. So we need to understand that we are supporting illegal activity. Jamila Maitland, TVJ News. And it's time for a break here on the Midday News, but stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to the Midday News. It's now time for the Business Minute. GK Investments has increased its stake in Spur Tree Spices Jamaica. In a notice to the Jamaica Stock Exchange, the parent company Grace Kennedy says 60 million units of shares in Spur Tree Spices Jamaica Limited were purchased by the firm. Now this brings GK Investments stake in the spices manufacturer to 20.18%. About two years ago, GK Investments increased its stake in the spice maker to 9.84%. Now this made it the third largest shareholder in the company at that time. Based on the value of Spurtree Spices as of the close of trading on Wednesday. The transaction would be valued at about $144.6 million, depending on when the deal was closed. Further afield, Netflix says its profits have soared in the first three months of this year, partly thanks to a crackdown on password sharing. Now, the streaming giant says it added 9.3 million customers in the first quarter, bringing its total number of subscribers to almost 270 million. The company also says its profits in the first quarter jumped to more than $2.3 billion. And that's it for the Business Minute. Time now for the top regional and international stories. I'm Karian Simpson. Thanks, Karian. We head to a quick break. When we come back, we'll have your midday sports report.